Well, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming on a Friday evening, especially. It's really good to see you all. I hope you'll thoroughly enjoy tonight. Though we're on, um, yeah, we're on a bit of a difficult subject. We're really going to try and tackle the whole issue. Why does God allow suffering? Why do bad things happen to people? And we'll find that in the story. Um, I, I had a guided tour around your graveyard earlier, so I've been taking photographs of the, the famous and the infamous. And uh, I d I d Did I tell you on... When was it? Wednesday. No, I don't think I told you about the, the famous gravestone in Leeds. If ever you go to Leeds, there's a huge, huge graveyard at the north of Leeds. But there's one gravestone that's quite well known. People go just to see it. It's called Ethel. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an open door, sculptured, of course, in stone. And it's huge. So the doorposts are like this, probably, I don't know, eight, nine, ten feet high. And the door's open. And there's a sculpture of Ethel. And she's like this. And um, when she died, around about 1910, her husband was so stricken with guilt that every night his wife would be at the door waiting for him to come home from the pub that he felt the best way to commemorate her was to have a sculpture of her there waiting for him to come home from the pub. Ethel, you've not got anything quite like that, but you've got some good gravestones. Uh, John T. now is providing guided tours, and uh, uh, it's fascinating. Well, anyway, it's good to be here. Yes, books. I did bring one or two books, but greatly depleted. Let me just mention, those of you who were here on Wednesday, and we didn't have sufficient of Catherine Haddo's book, um, uh, I've brought some copies here. I think all the books on the bookstall are either £1 or £3 each, which I think is pretty good. Um, I went... I went, was it yesterday? It was yesterday to your new bookshop in Bath, which is in the old Quake meeting place. Have any of you? Amazing. Anyway, I was buying a, I shouldn't really be telling you, I was buying a book by P.G. Woodhouse, and there were about four or five of them. And, um, so I, I looked at, I'm a Yorkshireman, you see, I looked at all the, uh, 12 pounds, 12 pounds, 12, and then I found the same book, 10.99. Oh, I was so chuffed. Anyway. And do you know, they charged me on the, on the Visa or MasterCard £12, so yes, I went and put my £1 and a penny back. But anyway, there we are. Uh, you must go and have a look at the shop. But these are incredibly cheap. Um, I'm going to mention two tonight, besides the one from Catherine. Life Stories. It's a bit like the Passion for Life I mentioned earlier in the week. A series of testimonies, stories of how people became Christians. And there are some great ones here. There are the most famous one, remember this old. Paul Jones, who was Manfred Mann. Oh, there you are. We've got one or two old people here. Famous for songs, who I did, 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 really intelligent stuff. Um, but how he became a Christian is fascinating. It really is. But uh, very interesting as well, Stuart Burgess, who lives not very far away from here, professor of um, engineering in Bristol and Cambridge. And, um, uh, yeah, he's just a genius, really. Um, voted Mechanical Engineer of the Year Award last year. His story, and it, again, very interesting. Um, Billy McCurry, former UVF terrorist. Well, there's some great stuff. I'd forgotten how good this is. And it's only a pound. So you've got all these stories and then an explanation as to what it means to be a Christian. So they are cheaper than an Easter egg and uh, is much better for you, I'm sure. And then this one, I, th I think this is wonderful. Um, Maud Kell's autobiography. Maud Kell's is in late 80s. She is at this moment in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where she has worked all her life as a missionary. But just because she's in her late 80s hasn't stopped her. So she's still out there. Uh, she's an Ulster woman. She oozes personality. But I suppose she really became a very well known. About six years ago, she was out there and she was shot. Uh, she was shot through the soul, uh, shoulder, and the bullet not only went through, it came out of the other end. And as she fell to the ground on a street, a pool of blood, she prayed. This was her prayer. Dear God, don't let me die. I've got so much more I want to do for you yet. She's, she's out there, and if ever you hear her speak, she's worth going to hear speak. She'll wear the dress with a bullet hole here and a bullet hole at the back as well. Uh, but it's a really good autobiography, three pounds. But this is not a Tupperware party. You don't have to buy anything, okay? It's just there as a, as a little extra. I want to read a, a short passage from the Bible, which I'm going to go to at the very end. 
uh, after I've interviewed Neil. It's found in the Gospel of Mark, and it's a well-known story, but we'll, we'll sort of draw things to a close by looking at it. Mark chapter 4, this is what we read. On the same day, when Jesus had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? There are great passages. We'll come back to that later on. But now it's my privilege to introduce Neil. And again, I think we should really give him a very warm welcome. Let's. Um... Now, Neil, you are fairly local to here, aren't you? Where, where are you from? Um, or where are you working now, anyway? Yeah, so uh, I'm, uh, I've just driven across from South Bristol, so not very far at all. If you're flying out from the airport, you'll drive straight past us and not stop. You can give us a wave. And, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll have been past us without stopping, I'm sure. Right, okay. And are planes taking off in good numbers these days? Looks like it to me. Yeah, it's, we're not quite under the flight path. I can only hear right, the first okay. thing in the morning while I'm lying in bed before <laughs> the traffic starts. All yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, now you're a church minister. Yep. And uh, what sort of a church is it? So it's um, an independent evangelical church in the south of the city. So, yes, yeah, nothing like this. It was built in, 19, in the 1960s, and it looks like it. And any, um, any interesting gravestones around about? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll There's plenty of rubbish in the local river, though, if you want to have a look at that <laughs> instead. Right, okay. yeah, yeah. Great. Tell us about your background, your, your upbringing. Um, so I was brought up in Hertfordshire. And um, there's nothing particularly famous about where I grew up. I grew up in a place called Welling Garden City that you probably haven't oh, heard right. of. It's one of the new yeah. towns to the north of London. The two things it's famous for, if you remember shredded wheat, do you remember the adverts? You, nobody can eat three shredded wheat. And <laughs> yeah. Ian Botham used to have, the reason was it was horrible. Uh, but the, um, oh, no, I love shredded wheat. Oh, oh well, I won't do it down. But that's where, that was the most famous product from the city. And when the ovens opened, the whole town smelt of shredded wheat so <laughs> it's a love hate sort of thing with shredded wheat <laughs> and for those of you who like your football David James who is the England and Liverpool goalkeeper also grew up on my street oh, so right, I okay. he, it's my only big name drop tonight so if that didn't get it for you nothing else will do you think he at this moment is talking about you I hope so <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. okay so that was home uh, Christian home or not yes it was so um, my mum and dad are both Christians. They both now live actually in Bath, so they're not far from here. Go to St. Bart's Church. My um, dad was from missionary family, so uh, grew up in India. I'm the first of five generations actually to be born in the UK. Everyone else was born in India and missionaries out there. My Amazing. grandfather met Mahatma Gandhi, uh, so that's that side of the family. But my dad actually didn't become a Christian until he was at university. So although he okay. grew up with it, he would say, um, that was where he was saved under Michael Saywood's ministry. Okay. Um, so that's where he was. And my mum was not from a Christian family. Okay. Uh, but were you brought up hearing missionary stories and great not adventures? Really. Not no, really. No, my dad oh, was not interested in any. My, I was, my dad's an engineer. I was brought up being shown telephone exchanges and um, the <laughs> wonders of modern computing. So that was my upbringing. Uh, no, right, my okay. mum's background was different. My grandfather's a Polish Catholic. Um, who came over here during the war. He was 18 when the war broke out. Blitzkrieg hit Krakow, where he lived, and uh, he was on national service and basically said it was in the afternoon, the planes flew over, and they, well, we see it on the telly now with the Ukraine, yeah, don't we? we do. With the planes again and bombing of civilians, he said he tried to get as many people to safety as he could. He was captured twice by the Nazis, escaped twice, and made his way down through Europe and landed in Scotland, where he met my gran, but was very hard and to, like, any concept of God all the remaining mm. days of his life. It scarred people. Yeah, yeah, it really did. And my mum was then brought up in that environment. But then some of you have heard of an evangelist from America called Billy Graham. Mm. And my mum lived in London and she went to the 1960s events taken by a friend and she put her faith and trust in Jesus. When mm. she did, my grandfather whipped her 
threw her out on the street with Ooh. all her stuff in a suitcase and said she wasn't coming home. Um, but my her younger sister threatened to leave, and that opened the door for my mum to come back into the family. But she wow. had a pretty tough she start did. to her Christian life. You don't imagine that in the UK, do you? But all right, so um, you were brought up in a Christian family, but did that make you a Christian? How did you become a Christian yourself? So, I mean, I remember hearing about Jesus for the first time when I was six from my mum. So I'd, I've gone to church, I'm told, since I was in nappies. I don't remember that. But pretty much from the time I got home from hospital, I was taken every week. But when I was six, my mum said she put me to bed one night and um, she came in to find me crying. And being a good mum, she said, are you sick? And I was like, no. So I said, why are you crying? I said, well, what would happen to me and my brother if you and dad died? I don't know why at six years old that occurred to me. And my mum, instead of saying, look, I'm not even 30 yet, I'm not going to die for a long time, actually said, you're right, we could die, but if we did, we trust in Jesus and we go and be with him. And when you're older, if you trust in him, then you will go and be with him too and be back together as a family again. I'm not saying I became a Christian then, but I remember that, and she wrote that down, and I rolled over and went straight to sleep. So it's enough of an answer for a six-year-old. I would say I became a Christian when I was 17 for, for my own kind of faith yeah. and trust and the difference that it made. And um, were, were you still at school then? or Yeah, yeah. just uh, I was revising for my A-levels. I don't know where you're going to be on this, Roger, but I'll tell you the true story and then you can weigh it for yourself. So I was revising for my history A-level and um, I heard the voice of God for the only time in my life. An audible voice. Yes, okay. that made me turn around and look. Right. So only time in my so life. Go on, what did the voice say? Just very briefly, do you love me? Well, I've got to say, I interview people you know, a yeah. lot, all sorts of people. And there are several who said very similar things. Well, that's so reassuring for me. Yeah. yeah. So you heard that voice. On the Saturday night. Was it night. with a Yorkshire accent? Or I what? wish no, it no. was. No. <laughs> okay. uh, but there was, no. And then that was Saturday evening. And I didn't really know what to do with it. It happened twice. And I knew in my heart of hearts the answer to that question was no. I knew a lot about God. I could have done well in a quiz. But when it came to actually love and living, there was nothing there. And then the following morning, I went to the Easter breakfast at the church we went to, and the minister turned to the back of John's gospel, and the first words he read were, Jesus said to Simon Peter, do you truly love me? Mm. And I was absolutely gripped, but I still didn't know what to do. I think sometimes we don't explain clearly enough what to do next. So I knew I was being spoken to, and I knew I was being spoken to by God's word, and that evening was a baptismal service, and I went and as the people were baptized, they just said, if God's been speaking clearly to anyone this weekend, will you come to the front? And I was straight out of my seat. Really? And um, mm. the guy re-explained that Jesus had died on a cross for me, that he'd risen again so I could have new life. And then I prayed with him. And that changed my life. From that day on, however imperfectly, I've loved Jesus Christ. Amazing. Now, you've mentioned your brother. Older or younger? Two years younger. Okay. Also uh, in Bath. So some of you might know him because he's at Whitcomb Baptist Church as a pastor. Yeah, as as we, there are a couple of pastors. There are Paul, yeah. Paul Mallard as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and did he become a Christian at a similar sort of time, or he was after me? So I went off fresh to uni. So I was in my first year at Where? Bristol. At Bristol. So right. that's what brought. I've never left. Basically, I'm a very unadventurous person. You just need to know that about me. Um, I've travelled nowhere. But Bristol to Bath is about it. So I presume Leeds turned you down. They didn't uh, <laughs> I wouldn't have gone that far north. <laughs> that would have been too much of an adventure. So, I, no, I stayed uh, in, in Bristol. That's where I came. My brother came to visit me, and he was really not interested in Christian things at all at that stage. And I was desperate for him to become a Christian because I'd found it to be so good to know Jesus Christ that I just wanted my little brother to become a Christian. Oh. So I prepared a Bible study for him a to sermon. do before <laughs> breakfast. I didn't preach at that time, but I could lead a Bible study. So I went through Romans and wrote some questions out and got him up early because I thought, what wouldn't he like about that? And I used to pray before breakfast. So I thought he could just join me. So we had the most awkward Bible study of all time where I would ask him a question and he would say nothing. And then I would answer the question, ask the next question. He would say nothing. And on it went. Well, it sounds like a sermon. Yeah, yeah it does sound, it became like more like a sermon than I was <laughs> intending. And um, so that was pretty disastrous. Then I begged him to come to a kind of meeting, a Christian union meeting. And he did, because I begged him. But as soon as it was over, he just went down to the bar and got drunk with my friends. Mm. Um, and that was that. So I was a bit disappointed. I couldn't 
it seemed like it had been a pointless sort of weekend. Mm. And then as we were leaving, the university was about to have its missions week. And I was going to a prayer meeting. So I said, look, I've got to go to this prayer meeting. The station's down there. You'll be fine. I'll see you where the next holiday was. And he said, do you mind if I come and watch the prayer meeting? And I was a bit like, well, that would be weird. But I didn't say no. So I just said, yeah, why not? Thinking, I wonder if he's going to interrupt and actually just tell everyone that they're complete idiots and there is no God. But he didn't. He just stood really respectfully and watched probably about 50 or 60 of us praying mm. in a room in the World's Memorial Building in Bristol. And at the end of it, he said to me, Neil, have you got a Bible? And I have my Bible on me, so I just gave it to him. And he read John's Gospel on the train between Bristol Temple Meads and London Paddington. And at the end of the journey, gave his life to Jesus Christ. Mm, amazing. Now, I've deliberately asked about your brother. I know we're interviewing you, but it's all bound up. Um, eventually, we were to meet a young lady. We both met our first wives at university. Right. Yeah. Uh, was it love at first sight? It was for me. It, yeah, it, what, yeah. Was, it, was it for her? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it really wasn't. She thought I was a complete idiot. So if you don't like me tonight, you're in good company. <laughs> Elaine didn't talk to me for a whole year after I first met her. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah. But I'm an acquired taste. Oh, right. Yeah. But eventually. Yes, yeah, eventually. And, yeah. and her job? She was... Do you want to do my brother or do you want to do me first? No, you Which first. Go okay, on me first one, yeah. then. Okay. Uh, she, was in a, uh, uh, she studied medicine and did obstet obstetrics and gynecology actually at the RUH in Bath. So that's where she worked. Right, okay. Uh, and your brother, yeah, he married? He married, um, yeah, another girl from university, Sarah. Another medic? No, she did languages. Oh, how boring. Yeah, yeah I know. Really yeah. Why doesn't everybody just speak English? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we won't go down that line. Okay. Um, uh, all right. So you're both married and you're both living as Christians. You've got Christian families. There's a big but coming, isn't there? There is. Because, uh, and I suppose this is a theme in many ways, uh, you're going to hear some very sad news, won't you? Yeah. So the first cancer is really part of, I guess, our family story in my generation. So my brother's first wife, Sarah, um, was 33 when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. I remember being sat in the garden. My boy at the time was just a few years old, and I remember he'd just done a magic show for us. <laughs> and um, it was hilarious because he got all his toys out and put them in the garden, and then he got me and his mum to sit down and said, close your eyes, so we did. And then one at a time, his toys would disappear, but you could hear him bouncing them down <laughs> the steps and hiding them around the corner. So at the end, I went to him, that was amazing, Isaac. And he went, not really. He said, all my toys are just down there. <laughs> so he was no magician, and that no. certainly not carried on. But yeah, in the middle of it all, my brother phoned and just said that his wife had breast cancer and it was serious. Mm. Um, and she then went through 18 months of treatment. And actually... The day before my son's sixth birthday, so it must have been about four when he was doing this magic show, uh, she um, had been taken ill, and they thought it was a reaction to her chemotherapy, but the, um, it wasn't. And my brother rang me from the hospital to say, I've been here 48 hours. I feel too tired to drive home. Do you mind coming to pick me up? Mm. So I did the journey from Bristol to Bath, which I've done many times before. Six years to the day, from when I've been driving Elaine across to give birth to Isaac, she gave birth actually in the RUH. So I was remembering that story, and actually mm. I managed to get lost that evening while Elaine was very much deeply in labour, and she was really cross with me. Um, but we eventually got there, Isaac was born, and all was well. And I was just remembering that, pulled into the car park to pick my brother up, to find that the doctors had just said to him, please don't go home, we're not sure she's going to make it through the night. So I rang my first wife, Elaine, and said that to her and said, don't worry, I'll be back by seven in the morning. When Isaac comes through, it'll all be well. He'll get his presents, we'll be in bed, all the stuff he loves doing will be done. And in the time it took me to make that call, Sarah's heart had stopped. And I ran back onto the ward and found my brother there as the crash team were coming. I've never seen it live. I've seen it often on the television mm. when they put the paddles on and they restarted her heart. But to be honest with you, she was pretty much gone. She How old was she? 35. So she was wow. young, and my brother's children at the time were five and three. Mm. So it was it was a really really now, tough did time. Did that make either him or you question your faith? What was really amazing in that moment when the crash team arrived, I'll never forget the first thing he said to me. We were literally hanging on to each other. It was incredibly frightening, and he just turned to me and said, 
she's going home, isn't she? And my brother's faith never wavered. I'm not saying grief was easy. It really wasn't. He was physically very unwell with his grief. Um, But I never, ever heard him complain. I never, that's not true. Actually, once he said, I'm going to be so lonely. That is the only negative thing I heard him say ever. The rest of the time, he was just brilliant with his girls and really stay close to Jesus throughout the whole thing. Hmm. But you were going to get the same sort of news, weren't you? Yeah, so years later, six, yeah, about six years later, um, my wife would then die also of bowel cancer. So, yeah, she had been very, very well. Um, and s- Well, we're 40 years old. We, the only symptom she had was she felt a bit tired, but she was a doctor with two young children and a pastor's wife, and I just thought, well, Of course, she's a bit tired. Mm. You know, we're not as young as we used to be, and we're really busy. And so she had no other symptoms except uh, uh, tiredness. And then we went out for dinner on the 1st of December 2013 to friends who lived just around the corner. When she came back, she was holding her abdomen, and she just said, I've got really um, severe abdominal pain. Uh, I said, what are you going to do? She said, well, I'm not going to come out again tonight. So I'll go to bed, take some paracetamol, and see if it all settles down. So she did that. And then her dad rang to say her mum had been rushed into Exeter Hospital with exactly the same symptoms. So she then jumped in the car, picked up her sister and drove down to Exeter. Two days later, they found that her mum had a huge hernia and that was what was causing her pain. But Elaine's was getting worse. So she drove back again and was admitted to the BRI with what they thought was chronic appendicitis. Uh, An appendix had exploded, but it that wasn't the underlying issue. And I always remember wheeling her out of the BRI in Bristol and she was in a wheelchair now and she had gone in walking and was now coming out in a wheelchair. And her turning to me, she had read her own discharge notes and saying, Neil, I've got cancer. They just haven't found it yet. And how long after that did she die? Um, Well, there was quite a a, a range of treatments in between. So about three weeks later, they found the cancer. She was conscious while they were doing it on the scan. And so she saw it. And I listened to an interview with her just a couple of weeks ago. And I remember that she commented when she saw it, wow, that's a very beautiful cancer, which is just a very weird medic's comment. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. It wasn't very beautiful at all. So by the time they found it, her bowel had plenty of cancer in it. So did her ovaries. She transferred her care to the RUH in Bath. And two brilliant consultants there operated on her. And uh, they took out as much as they could. And then I remember Ed Courtney, who's a fantastic surgeon. And he rang me and said, Neil, where are you? I said, I'm upstairs in the chapel. And he came up to the chapel and sat down with me and said those words that none of us ever want to hear, which were, Neil, I am very sorry. And he just said it was all over her peritoneum. I'd never heard of a peritoneum before. It's like a piece of cling film that runs down the front of your abdomen. And it just had cancer all over it. And once you've got that, it is utterly incurable. So she lasted 20 months with cancer, 22 rounds of chemotherapy to hold it at bay. And we had one week when she was very poorly, one week when she was very up and down, and one week where it was as if she didn't have cancer. We did so many nice things. But eventually, you can't yeah. keep doing that. No. Um, obviously, I'm going to ask how you reacted. But how was she facing all of this? Because she was a Christian. Yes. But she knew she was dying. Yes. She understood probably a lot better than you what was actually happening she to really her did. physically. Um, did this shake her faith? What was her attitude to impending death? She was remarkable, really. The, the year or two before she died, she'd actually suffered quite badly with depression. And she was really low. Uh, This was before she was diagnosed and before there was anything much wrong. Um, And again, you weigh this. The night before she fell sick, the Lord, she was dreaming. The Lord came to her in a dream and just said, I'm going to give you rest. And the next day she fell sick. And she took that as a sign that God was absolutely in control of this process. And she found peace in that. And her mantra became, which she'd said to me and the boys every day, God is wise, God is good, God is in control. And she lived that out. That was what she said. That's my foundation. God's wise, he's good, he's in control. And she was remarkable. I mean, she went through immense suffering. So she, her cancer was a horrible cancer. All cancers are horrible. 
but hers, she said the pain was worse than giving birth to our two sons. And she had no pain relief for Isaac and paracetamol for Oscar. So she had an incredibly high pain threshold. Mm. And she would go from being fine to screaming our house down. And there was nothing we could do. But despite that, she never doubted that God was good, wise, and in control. And in fact, I looked after her at home. So she died at home with me and the boys, and we'll come to that in time. The last time she came down the stairs was the week before she died. It's the Bristol, Bristol Bloom Festival, for those of you who have seen it. It's one of her favorite times I of the year. That, yeah. And she came down. I didn't realize quite enough how weak she was, really, although she had not been down much. And she sat in the garden watching the blooms going over. Mm. And she was also writing something. Her eyesight was going at this point, mm. and it was incredibly difficult for her and labors. But after she died, she'd hidden it for me to find, and on it she'd written. And on that day, when my strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending 10,000 years and then forevermore. It's a and hymn. It's mm. a hymn. Mm. And so she never doubted that God was everything she needed for this season. Mm. She, we sat down, actually, just before she died and asked, did we regret what had happened to us? Would we have chosen it if we could have chosen and we said no, but actually it was close than you would think because of all the good that had already come from her illness. Mm. And because she had a confident hope that the best was yet to come. Mm. She said she'd miss seeing me get old. Well, that'd be nothing special in that. And watching the boys grow up. Mm. But apart from that, she didn't find letting go of things very difficult at How all. How long ago was this? Uh, she died 14th of August, 2015. So it's not that long now. Just sorry, I'm, I'm sort of compounding the issue. Your brother remarried, but he married somebody who a week before was diagnosed with cancer. Yeah, so Melissa, his wife, lives with incurable lung cancer. And, and she was diagnosed, she was told she's got cancer just one week before the wedding. Yes, that's right. Do you feel that things haven't worked out very well for you? Well, yeah, I guess if this world is all there was and all there is, then, yeah, we've not had it. We've not had a straightforward time. I really feel for my parents as well. I know, well. I was going to ask about your parents. You know, I just feel really, I've not, my dad's not a crier. I'm a real crier. So far, I've been quite calm tonight, but I'm not always. Um, and I remember when Sarah died, he was obviously heartbroken. When they came to the RUH and I had to tell him that Elaine was going to die and just seeing him break down and cry, you know, was one of the saddest things I've seen. And so to see their faith tested and not to have an easy sort of older age, I mm. think it's been really hard on them. So, yeah, humanly speaking, I think things have been quite messed up. Yeah. But this world isn't all there is. And so I think, I guess for a lot of us, heaven seems like a second prize after you've had a long life here, doesn't it? We don't think about it much. We just think, well, actually, this life is the really important one. But actually, this life is very, very short. Mm. No matter how long we live, I just... Um, had a friend of mine who was 100 and she died a few weeks later but in the grand scheme of things it's mm. nothing is it it's not long no um and you've married again yes are you a bit worried that your wife might get cancer i'm not but she was so <laughs> <laughs> before we got married she went for about 15 mot's on different parts of her body just to check but no she's fine amazing so why has god allowed all of this well there's no i can't tell you why my brother's wife's have both had cancer, why mine does. We're not given individually an answer. I guess the thing I think is this, like we're all born and we all know, if we're honest, that one day we're going to die, don't we? The, what makes the shock in our story is that the, all the wives have died, or well, my mm. wife and um, my brother's first wife died young. So mm. Sarah was 35, Elaine was 42. They're young. Melissa's younger still and is living with cancer. You know, they are all young. But the truth is, we all know we're going to die. When I was born, I was a very sickly baby. And my Uncle Jack was in the Merchant Navy. And after I was taken off the incubator, he came in to see me. And he held me in his big pirate arms with his big um, tattoos <laughs> with his anchors there. It must have been quite a sight. They didn't have a picture of it. I like to have seen it. But my mum always recounts the story because she was feeling quite fragile. I nearly died when I was born. 
And there he was holding me, this big guy with this tiny little baby kneel in his arms. And he said, Vanda, if there's one thing you can say for certain about this little boy, it's he's one day nearer his death. At which point my mum <laughs> burst into tears <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, cried. So I don't recommend it as a kind of approach. <laughs> but there is a kind of truth in it, I think, Roger. You know, that actually we're all one day nearer seeing God, meeting him face to face. And actually, if you know him as a friend, although it is hard and although I grieved and Elaine was my best friend, you know, and watching the boys go through grief, I found almost harder than my own. You know, just being powerless at times to help them. We've all shared that hope that Elaine, not because she was good, but because she trusted Jesus, is in heaven. And heaven is a real place with real people. She still remembers us. And one day we will see her again on that same day we see Jesus. And that is a hope to hang on to. What's your wife called? And what's her name like? Um, Susan. Is she Susan Hare? Elaine and Susan? That's a very dangerous question, Roger. Uh, what I, no, I try not to. In every... We could do a whole thing on second marriage at some point, Roger, but we <laughs> right. won't do that tonight. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I try not to. What I describe it as is having two rooms in my heart. And the one with Elaine now is sealed. There's nothing new that's being added to that. I loved Elaine. She was my best friend. We got together at 19, got married at 23, and she died at 42 and married for 19 years. We just had our 19th wedding anniversary, and then she died. And she is irreplaceable to me, and she's irreplaceable to the boys. And Susan has never tried to replace Elaine. The boys don't call her mum. She's Susan to them, and I think that's wise and right because of the age they were. And she's my wife, and I love her to bits. And we're learn. I'm a terrible husband, and so we're learning again. I'm making. I always thought I'd have learned something from 19 years from my first marriage, but I haven't. I'm still just a complete pain to live with. Still just as difficult. Susan needs tons of patience, and we're learning to love one another. I don't think marriage. Some of you have straightforward marriages. Both my marriages have been really tough, and I've come to the conclusion I'm the common factor. So. <laughs> <laughs> that must just be how it is being living with me. Yeah, I just want to go back to this. You've already answered the question a little bit. You're absolutely confident that Elaine is in heaven, and you said it's not because she was good, but because of Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember the day she died, Roger. She was at home. She had been largely unconscious the day before. And I'd gone to bed that night. Elaine was hilarious in that whatever limited strength she had left, there was a hospital bed that was put next to our bed. And the medics every day would pick her up and move her into the hospital bed. And every day, as soon as our bedroom door closed, she would literally take the two steps back into our bed because she just decided that's where she was meant to be and that was where she was going to die. So I went to bed on the Thursday and she had been conscious briefly in the morning, but not for the rest of the day. And I was really worried that I was going to go to bed, fall asleep, and miss the moment when she died. And again, the Lord's very gracious, and he basically promised me that wouldn't happen. So I went to sleep, got six hours sleep, and in the morning, she was still there, um, still breathing very shallowly. So I rang the hospice, because I'm not medical, and just said, what do I need to do this morning? And they said, check her hands and her feet. So I did, and I said, they're still warm. They said, that's a good sign. And then almost as soon as I hung up, her breathing changed completely. And so I shouted downstairs to the boys who were 9 and 11. I said, boys, come quick, come quick. And they ran up the stairs. They've been playing on their Xbox. And um, I said, you've just got to, your mom, this is it. You know, you just give your mum a kiss. You know, tell her you love her. And they did. And then I did the same. And then she took her final breath. And in that moment, all I could think, there are some words in the Bible that just say, where our death is your victory, where our death is your sting. It had been such a hard and long illness, but the death itself was utterly peaceful. And then I remembered the story where Jesus um, went to a bereaved family. Their little girl had died. And he went into the house with the parents and a couple of his disciples. And he took the little girl by the hand and he said, little girl, I say to you, get up. And I just imagined on the other side of death, Elaine meeting Jesus for the first time and him saying to her, little Elaine, I say to you, get up. And Roger, I have no doubt 
no doubt that Sarah's in heaven, no doubt that Elaine's in heaven, no doubt that when I die, I'll be in heaven, not because I'm a good man, I am a thoroughly terrible man, but because Jesus was the perfect man and my trust is in him. I'd like to leave it there, really, because it's a very powerful note, but I'm not going to. I want to be cynical and All say, right. um, are you sure this isn't just a um, I think what I, because it's easy to respond emotionally, isn't it, to these things. But the great thing about Christianity is it's not just emotion. These things really happen in history. So the stories of Jesus are verifiable. Paul, actually, when he's talking about the resurrection, which is the thing I'm pinning all my hope on, is that Jesus didn't just die. Thousands of people were executed on crosses. One came back from the grave. No one saw it coming. You know, one of the things I think surprising in the gospel stories is Jesus has many times said, <laughs> three days later, I'm going to rise. I was, you know, they should have had popcorn and sunglasses <laughs> and been sat around the tomb. But no one saw it coming. Not even though he'd said it. Once you're dead, you're dead, right? But Jesus came back from the dead and was seen by the women who went to the tomb. He was seen by his disciples. He was seen by his mum. He was seen by more than 500 others at once. You know, these people knew him. And if they are eyewitnesses of that event, no matter how strange it would be, I'm willing to put my confidence in those people who basically stake their own lives on it being true. Mm -hmm. It would be much easier for them to have said, no, this didn't happen. We made it all up. And they would have lived much longer lives themselves with a lot less hassle. But saying Jesus rose from the dead, therefore he is the king, really landed them in hot water. So I'm basing my confidence on what they said they saw. Mm. Wow, that's very, very moving. I, I Probably the thing that will stay with me is the idea of the disciples with sunglasses and popcorn. But I nevertheless, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was very, very powerful. Do you, I don't know, do you sometimes quietly without your wife and your sons watching cry still? No, not anymore. I mean, I cry about lots of things, but not necessarily, no, not usually about that. The, the time I cried most, my, I had a very simple plan. For, I'm a very simple man. My plan for my life was to get married in my 20s. I found Elaine who was willing to do that. Have children. We had that. 40s, get ready to leave home. I'm nearly 50 now, and then nearly left home. That's worked well. 60s, empty nest, a bit of fun. 70s, want to be, you know, or 60s grand. 50s, empty nest. 60s, grandfather. 70s retire and 80s go off into the sunset. You know, <laughs> that, that was my plan for my life, just laid out in decades. Like that in I, I plan. I'm a planner, Roger. Okay. And that was my plan. So my plan has been detonated. Mm. But, and it was when that plan went, when Elaine was diagnosed for about five months, I cried every day in the shower. Did you? Mm. I really grieved over my life being so messed up. Um, but no, since then, I just think I'm at peace with it, partly because she was and partly because Jesus is what I need to get through each day. Mm. Last question. Wh why didn't God stop it all? Well, I guess he could have done. And mm. lots of people live long lives, don't they? Your story won't be exactly the same as mine, but I guess there are people here who have suffered in other ways. Uh, the only way he could stop it all is to stop this world, isn't it? Because actually part of being in a broken world is that these things happen. And just because you're a Christian or whatever you believe, there is no way of stopping this. Anyone who says there is, is a liar. Um, we're all going to go through tough times. And we're all going to suffer in some ways if we live long enough. And one day we're going to lose people we love. And another day it's going to be our turn. Uh, that's, that's the reality. That's not being bleak. That's just being honest. Um, but the good news of the Bible is that actually a world is coming, which is the one we all want where mm. actually God puts everything right, where all evil is banished and all suffering is over and we'll live with Jesus forever in a world where love's like breathing. And um, yeah, until Jesus does that, then this is the world in which we live. Mm. And we just have to choose how we're going to respond. We can become mm. hard and cynical, bitter and broken. And I've watched people who've responded to Elaine's death in that way. So her mum and dad aren't Christians. They have no hope. They don't expect to see her again. They are absolutely confident that she's been cremated and that's her done. And I can watch their life and say, well, that's your worldview. That's your narrative. That's how you live. And there's no joy in it, none whatsoever. And I can have my worldview based on the facts of the gospel and the fact that Jesus really rose. And I can find enormous joy even on the worst of days. 
because Jesus is with me and he's what I need. Great. I've really let this chat go on a long time, but I found it fascinating. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, and you'll stay around and talk with folk, won't yeah, you? Yeah, anyone that wants to chat. I, I'm usually quite shouty from the front. I will listen carefully <laughs> when you're talking to me. And yeah, yeah, if there are things you want to talk about, then of course. Thank you very much. Let's show our appreciation, shall we? Thanks. No, Thank, yeah, you. Thank you. I really just want to explore a little bit more that uh, whole theme of of suffering, if you don't mind, but I found that very moving. I've talked to and interviewed Neil before, but yeah, very moving to hear it again. Thank you so much. The passage I read earlier, do you mind if we just go back to it and we just talk from the Bible about what the Bible teaches on this whole idea of why does God allow suffering? Why doesn't he intervene? If God is all powerful, he could change things. If, if he's all loving, then wouldn't he want to, etc. I, I, as far as I understand, sudden storms on the Sea of Galilee were fairly normal. It wasn't an unusual sort of thing to go, uh, to happen. But 2,000 years ago, you've got this situation where you've got the disciples in a boat. Of course, the disciples, some of them were fishermen. They're in a boat with the Lord Jesus Christ on the Sea of Galilee. We, we call it a sea. It's a huge lake, apparently 26 miles long, 13 miles wide. And it seems, and I use the word carefully, it seems as though all hell was let loose. Suddenly, this dreadful storm uh, arises. And, and we find Jesus asleep. I find that quite interesting. The only time in the Bible where we actually read of Jesus being asleep, it doesn't mean he didn't sleep, but here we've got Jesus asleep um, in the boat. And um, he's exhausted. He's as we'll see in a, in a moment, he's a real man. He's exhausted despite the storm and the winds and the waves. He, he's just asleep on this, this pillow. Well, you can imagine the disciples, they're going to do their best to try and get out of the situation. They'll row, they'll sail, etc. But they are in a desperate situation. And, and not knowing what to do, they, they shake and they wake him. And they come out with this question, don't you care that we're perishing? What a question to ask. They were scared to death, and, and Jesus responds, and he says, why are you so afraid? And then he says, oh, oh you have little faith, why are you like this? And, and Jesus rose and rebuked the wind and the waves. Now, if you and I tried to do that, you know, men in white coats would come and take us away, wouldn't they? He, he spoke to the wind and the waves, and in an instant, there was calm and there was tranquility. Uh, and the disciples look on and say, who is this man that even the wind and the waves uh, obey him? It's a, it's a tremendous miracle. I remember years ago, I was, I was on the ferry from um, Stranra in those days. Now it's Khan Rai and across to Larn. And it, it, in those days, it was a, a journey that took about two and three quarter hours. We'd been, I was with a friend, we'd been on the, on the ferry for four hours and we were just being thrown around. And eventually, over the tannoid system, came this announcement that they really apologized. It would be another four hours before we could get into harbor. But then they said, to compensate, we, we, we'd like to give everyone a free meal. Well, you've got to imagine, there we are being thrown around. And who wanted a meal? But for a Yorkshireman, the word free was very, very appealing. And um, I don't want to go into too many details. I remember exactly what I ate. And I'm sure the fish enjoyed it an hour or so later, but that doesn't matter. But uh, I would have loved to have had the power just to say, peace, be still. But of course, I don't have that power. Well, there's the incident. It's, it's in the Gospels. This is Mark's Gospel that we read earlier. It raises questions. There are questions, you know, you read this and we ask certain questions. Um, you know, where did this storm come from? It's fair enough to ask, you know, a bit like I asked, you know, wh where was God in all of this with with uh, Neil, you know, where, where's this, has, has God stirred up this storm? Or is it the devil? Has Satan caused the storm? Or is it just, as it were, nature? It's just one of those things. Where's the storm come from? And then why was Jesus asleep at this moment when he was so needed, you know? Where, where is God when trouble strikes? Where's God in Ukraine at the moment? Where's God when a little child is diagnosed with cancer? Where was God on September 11th, 2001? Or when death knocks at the door. And, and we ask this, don't we? Where, where is God in all of these things? I read today, Bible readings, this sentence. It comes near the end of the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. But it's a great sentence. 
The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children that we may learn to do the works of the Lord. So it's Moses speaking, and he says about God, there are things that we just do not know about him. They're secret. There are many other things we do know about God. And what we do know about God enables us to trust for what we don't know about God. So what do we know about God? Well, Christians believe that God has revealed himself. He's made himself known. He's eternal. He's a spirit. You can't put him in a box and study him, you know. Um, he knows all things. He can do all things. He's everywhere. He's a God who's just. He's a God who's holy. He's a God who's loving. One God, the Bible teaches, in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God, the Son, came into our world. So we know certain things uh, about God, but then, you know, why has Neil and his brother had to go through all that they've gone through? Why, why suffering in the, the way that we see it? And we do see it sometimes in a way that's heartrending. I don't know whether it was in your newspaper this morning, but in mine, I, I, almost unforgettable picture of a six-year-old boy in Ukraine, have you seen this? Putting food on his mum's grave. She starved to death. And he's wanting to die. I, I think, wh where is God in all of this? And I, I can't explain all these details. But there are things we do know about what has happened. The world that God created. The world that God created. And every day he created, he says, it's good. It's good, it's good. And then he makes the first man and the first woman. It's very good. The world that God created has been wrecked and ruined by deliberate, defiant rebellion. Defiance against God. God said, enjoy everything, but not to take of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God never desired humanity to discover evil. But we know what happened. They took and all of creation was ruined. And the world as it was became the world as it is. And we're sort of bound up in the bundle of life. I love that phrase. It's, it's one that a lady called Abigail used in the Bible. Bound up in the bundle of life. And we find ourselves in situations which are difficult. God can take the worst situations and bring out of them good. We know that. And just because one person suffers more than somebody else doesn't mean that that person is worse than somebody else. Jesus tackled that on, on a number of occasions. There was that man born blind and Jesus was asked, is he blind because he did something wrong or his parents? And said, no, no, Jesus. Actually, God is going to be honored through, through that, but it's not their sin that caused his blindness. And, and a tower had fallen, the Tower of Silo. 18 people died. And, and a number of people were going from Galilee down to Jerusalem, and they were worshipping. And Pontius Pilate, we know of him, of course, the one who was to sentence Jesus to, to be crucified. Pontius Pilate gave the order they should be killed, martyred. And again, Jesus said, look, the, the lesson to learn from that is not that they're getting the punishment that they do. No, no, no. The lesson, he said, is everybody needs to repent lest something worse happen to us. So, because one person has suffered more than someone else doesn't mean that um, they've done worse things. Far from it. In fact, of course, we're going to see in a moment that God totally identified himself with human suffering when Jesus came into the world. So, there are questions w that we ask. But then, in this passage, there are questions the disciples ask. First one was, don't you care that we perish? I don't know what your view, your thought of God is. But from everything God has said about himself, and certainly from Christian experience, despite the questions we have, I think we would all say, yeah, we have proved that God does care. And one of the lovely things I think about the Lord is that he not only cares, but he can cope. Because you often get people who care, but they can't cope. But God cares and he can cope. And then the second question the disciples ask, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? I don't know whether you know the name Wiesel. He became a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, and I, I personally think the most powerful secular book I've ever read in my life was written by him. It's only short, 
um, but it will leave a, a lasting memory if you, if you read it. It's called Night. When he was 14 years of age, he was in Romania, and the Gestapo came in, and he was from a Jewish family. He was captured, and he was taken to Auschwitz. His whole family died there. He survived. He actually became professor of English literature in Boston. He wrote this book describing his first night in Auschwitz. Listen to this. Never shall I forget that night, the first night in camp which has turned my life into one long night, seven times cursed and seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. I forget the little faces of the children whose bodies I saw turned into wreaths of smoke beneath a silent blue sky. Forget those flames which consumed my face forever. Never shall I forget that nocturnal silence which deprived me for all eternity of the desire. Never shall I forget those nights to God at my side, my dreams to dust. Never shall I forget these things, even if I am condemned to live as long as God Himself. Never. It's very easy when we read about what's happening in Ukraine or just in the more personal story of Neil to think that God doesn't care, but he does. There's a God who knows the details of all our lives and he cares. He never wastes any tears. He never wastes any toil or time. He never wastes any pain. It's interesting for the, those who are trusting in him, God says, do you know, we are the apple of his eye. That is stunning. An infinite, eternal God, and you and I could be the apple of God's eye, uh, that our names are engraved on the palm of his hand. Uh, and I love this, that he takes all our tears and puts them into his bottle. <laughs> it's a lovely idea and phrase. I remember getting a letter from one lady once who knew that truth, and she said, God must have a very big bottle for all my tears. Well, the answer is he does. He's sufficient for all of these things. And even every hair on our head is numbered. And, and it doesn't just mean he knows how many. I looked it up once in an encyclopedia. Apparently we've got about 13,000, well, sorry, most of us have got about 13,000 hairs on our head. But no, everyone's individually numbered. This is number 202, this is number, et cetera. He knows our DNA. He knows the details of our lives. So he does care. And the disciples knew that really. But then this second question, and I think, it's amazing, I only read a few verses, but we get the answer to this second question just in these few verses. Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Well, we get it here. He was a real man. He was asleep. He was tired. He was exhausted. He knew what it was to be hungry, to be thirsty, to be tempted. He had skin that you could pinch. And he was a real man. And yet, he's the one who can stand and speak to the wind and the waves and they obey him because he's God. We, we talk about the incarnation, God clothing himself in humanity, God coming into our world. He's the one who can change a great storm into great calm. And he did it for Neil and his brother. And he did it, of course, for these disciples as well. Then just one last thing. The questions we ask, the questions the disciples ask. But then Jesus asked some questions. The questions he asked. Why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? What an interesting question. And I think especially in 2022, what an interesting question. If anything has characterized Britain in the last two years, isn't it fear? I, I, I mentioned earlier on in the week, my next door neighbors live just, you know, Terrace house and uh, our next door neighbors, right next to us, as it were, have not emerged for two years. I, I, I can't get my head around it. How, how do they cope with each other for that long? But never mind that. But they've just not emerged. And every Wednesday, the garage door opens and it's for the Morrison's delivery and then it closes. And that's it for two years. And why? Well, it's because of fear. Fear of what? Of disease? Yes. Fear of death. Huh. And yet here's Jesus saying, why are you afraid? Well, there was a storm raging, but Jesus came and he was going to go to the cross as all the prophets had, had said, and he was going to carry on 
on himself all the sin of the world. There's no way he's going to die in the middle of a lake in a storm. So why were they afraid? Jesus was with them. Oh, you of little faith. I, I wonder sometimes as well whether we fear, we fear that the past will catch up with us. Maybe not in this life, but maybe in death. We all know that there are things in our lives that are wrong, there are things we regret, there are things we don't want anybody else to, to know about. And we may have listened to Neil and thought, oh, right, he's, he's denigrating himself. But actually, isn't he honest? Well, none of us are the men, the women, the young people we want to be. Of course, the Bible calls it sin. Why are we afraid? Well, God is holy and just to meet him when we've sinned. But Jesus is saying it in a rhetorical way. He's, he's saying you don't need to be afraid. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ was going to go to a cross. He was going to suffer more than anything that was experienced in that storm in the lake. And he was going to take on himself our sin. I often think Jesus was like a magnet and he took everything which was opposite to him onto him. Was he honest? Absolutely. So did he take my lies? Yes, my lies laid on Christ. Was he pure? Absolutely. So did he take my impurity on him? Yes. And, and here is the Lord Jesus on a cross taking on himself the sin of the world. We've read in our papers about the most atrocious things in the last few days. All sin laid on Christ. I often think if you want evidence that Jesus really is God, just think of the fact that the world's sin compressed into three hours and laid on him. Most of us, all of us rather, our minds would just explode, wouldn't they? We couldn't cope with that. But Jesus took the sin of the world, but he took my sin, your sin. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, the Bible says. He died for us. If we fear the past, the past can be forgiven because Jesus died that it might be. Sometimes though, we fear the presence, don't we? You know, an older person fears a knock on the door at eight, nine o'clock in the evening. wonder what that's all about. But God promises to be with us. Once we ask the Jesus who died and was buried and rose from the dead, we ask him to forgive us. He promises to be with us. And actually, you can go through the Bible and some lovely thoughts. It says he goes before us. It says he goes beside us. He goes behind us. It says he's below us. It says he's above us. It says he abides within us. This is amazing, isn't it? When a person becomes a Christian, we are in Christ and Christ is in us, a bit like a sponge. You put a sponge in a bath full of water and well, what happens? The sponge is in the water or the water is in the sponge? Well, it's both true. And when a person becomes a Christian, God, by his spirit, comes to live within us. And he's with us, yes, dealing with the past, but he's with us for the present and for the future in that he goes before. He will guide us. You know, we, we've no idea, have we, about life, what today, what tomorrow, what the next day might hold. But the moment a person asks Jesus to forgive them, to become real to them, to become their Lord and Saviour, we're in his grip. And whatever happens, God promises his presence. And uh, yeah, I spoke about this earlier. My wife, she too has had cancer. I, last year, had cancer. You, you don't expect to have these things. But that's life. We're just bound up in the bundle of life. But God didn't suddenly desert us when my wife was diagnosed and when I was diagnosed. No, he takes you through these things. In the Bible, we read about some people who have no faith. And it may be that you're here tonight and you have no faith. You, somebody dragged you along and you think, oh, what am I doing here? But you've no faith. At all. Well, look, could I urge you, read, well, read Mark's gospel. I, I personally would always say go to Luke's gospel. But, uh, but read one of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Let God introduce himself to you. The Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And come and listen on a Sunday to the, the Bible being preached week by week and see whether God speaks to you. It may be audibly, but it may be just in your heart of hearts, in your mind, that you know God is communicating. God also in the Bible has said some have little faith. 
But little faith grows as you get to know God more through the Bible, through obeying what he says. Faith grows. And some have great faith. And it's a wonderful thing. Well, I find it's a wonderful thing to be able to put my head on my pillow at night and know if I never wake up again on earth, I will be with him. But then to wake up in the morning, and I find it hard to, you know, I need a good strong coffee or two to get going, but to wake up in the morning and say, right now, God's given me this day, I'm going to live with him and for him. Faith like a seed sort of sends its, its, its roots and its shoots and it grows and we become stronger and stronger. It's not based on feelings. My feelings vary immensely. Uh, you know, a lot depends on whether I've had a good meal or <laughs> a nice chat with somebody. Feelings change, but the Lord says, look, the, the, the tempest may be raging, but if the master is there, whatever happens, he'll see us through it. Last story. I always like to end it with a story because I think everybody will forget what I've just said, but they may just remember a story. Dr. Helen Rosevere was a bright, uh, sort of feisty. She went to Cambridge University to study medicine. She wasn't a Christian, came from a very, very well-to-do family. Her father was knighted. You know, she had a lot going for her, but she wasn't a Christian. But she met Christians at Cambridge, and they invited her for a weekend away. There was a very famous preacher preaching to them that weekend, Dr. Graham Scroggy, and as it happens, she became a Christian at that weekend, and it was to totally change her life. She completed her medical studies, but instead of working as a GP here in the UK, she trained uh, to do missionary work in what was called um, the Democratic, Re oh, well, it's called the Belgian Congo, and now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. She did an amazing work, one has to say. She, she personally founded 42 hospitals. That's pretty good, isn't it? And um, uh, she was a school teacher, a head teacher, a doctor. Uh, she trained doctors, she trained nurses, and she, she spoke the gospel wherever she could. She was an amazing woman, and some amazing things happened to her. But in 1964, there was the Simba Rebellion, uh, and many Western missionaries were killed. She was captured, and uh, she was beaten. She lost all her teeth. Later on, she had breast cancer, probably because of the kicking. She was raped. She was taken. I, I can't imagine this. She was lined up before a firing squad and at the last minute given a reprieve. She was imprisoned. In prison, she came up with this thought, and, and I, I find it totally st stunning. She asked herself this question. Well, I, I think I could have asked, can I trust God, even if he never tells me why? But she didn't ask that. She said, can I thank God that he trusts me with this suffering, even if he never tells me why? What a question. But you see, the Christian has an intimate relationship with the living God. And our trust is such that we, we say, God, whatever, as long as you're with me. And he promises to be with us through life, yeah, through death, as we heard. And then not to the hell. And I think if we could see the sin we have as, as God sees it, we'd say, I, I deserve hell. Not to the, the hell we deserve, but to be with God forever in heaven. A wonderful thing. I don't know that God would say to me, well done, Roger, but he will say, well, because of Jesus. He's taken the sin that would condemn me. I've received his forgiveness, his new life, all the goodness of Jesus credited to my account. That's an amazing thing. And you can know this as well, whatever, whether you're young, whether you're older, it's so important to, to know that you're right with God. And I would urge you tonight, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, whatever the storms of life you're facing, I'd urge you to do so. We're going to close with a prayer. Well, a couple of prayers. I'm going to pray, of course, for Neil and his family and other things uh, briefly. But before that, a prayer you could pray tonight if you would ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And night by night, we've seen 
people pray like this, I would urge you to pray. Make it your prayer where you're saying yes to the Lord Jesus and you're trusting him. I'll pray it fairly slowly. I do talk quickly, I know, but I'll pray, try and pray fairly slowly so you can, as it were, take the words, echo them, personalize them, make them your own, not out loud, but in your heart to God who hears and promises to answer. And if you pray with me, then I'd love you, please, to go to, come to me and just say, if you come to me, I have a booklet I'd like to give you, which has the prayer in it and uh, some tips about starting to live for Jesus day by day. But if you go to somebody else, they can come and say, can I have a booklet just for them? So I think you'd find that helpful. Let's, let's pray. So first of all, this prayer, which you could make your prayer. Dear God, you know everything there is to know about me. So I want to say I am sorry for my sin. And with your help, I want to turn from it. I believe Jesus died for me and rose from the dead. Please forgive me. Come and live in my life. Become my Lord and Saviour. And help me to follow you, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we thank you, Lord, for Neil. Pray for him and his wife and his boys. Pray for his brother and his sister in law. Lord, you know the whole situation there. We commit it to you and ask that you'd be very good to each of them. Draw near to them. Lord, we thought about Ukraine and there are many other situations in the world like that. Yemen, Armenia, which don't hit the headlines. Lord, we, we, we long for peace and we pray for peace. We thank you for each other and we pray for one another. You know all our needs and those whom we know and love. We commit them all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.